see an aerobic development and drop down to a developmental load for those sessions. So all the speed work we may do in the entire week is we'll get them warm, we'll do two sets of plyos, we'll do two flying 10 meter sprints, and that's it for speed for the week. In terms of the aerobic stuff, they might do 10 five second sprints, paying close attention to their heart rate, so basically five seconds work, heart rate to 130, go again, go again, go again. You can do up to 50 of those if you're targeting that block, but we just do 10 to just keep things ticking over. The focus is on the weights. And then low day similar. Typically on a Friday it'll be a captain's run, so we give them, we just say have that off and have the captain's run, match on a Saturday, and then we do a recovery protocol on a Sunday, which is, as a club, we're moving away from icing more because there's evidence that it slows inflammation, but it doesn't attenuate it in any degree. It just slows you getting back to where you should be. So our recovery is more movement based. Um, get the blood through the, the body because the blood is going to drive in fat drainage as well. And also it just gives them an opportunity to get in together, talk, and move. And it's, there's a social aspect. Do you know what I mean? talk about earlier on um, a hot and cold immersion? Yeah. Uh, it was context based, isn't it? Yeah. How does that link into what you were just saying in terms of the Because you get that um, hot and cold. As I understand it, I could be wrong. I'm having to revise my opinions and everything. It's, 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 it's vasoconstriction and vasodilation, yeah. and because the valves are unidirectional, when you constrict, blood has to go forward. When you relax, blood has to come forward again. So by contract, relax, right. in those vessels, I think you're going to drive. Lymphatic drainage is powered by what's coming through from the circulatory system. So you have to have blood flow to have lymphatic drainage. It's not enough to just sit on your ass. Do you use ice baths part of you? Less and less. Because um, if you look at things, you know, 24 hours later, the inflammation you get from uh, after a match is less after an ice bath, but it's still gonna, if you just slowed it down, it's still going to reach the same peak as if you didn't. And the, the goal with, especially in season, is to get them back to where they should be, ready for Saturday. So, and it's mostly perceived soreness, not um, chemical markers of damage like CK and neutrophils. Um, that's in season. In pre season, uh, the studies to show that ice baths actually um, attenuate adaptation. So, one of the, one of the triggers for hypertrophy is heat, heat activated proteins. So, if you're icing, you're not getting that. So, I would say if you're going to use it, try and use it in a manner that is specific to how you're training at that time. You know, you're not going to use it if you're in a hypertrophy block. If you've really got beaten up in a game, you might use it. More of the pain relief rather than the, the information. Exactly, yeah. And it's, it's perceived soreness, but you've got to remember that all stress, the first port of call is the central nervous system. Does the central nervous system perceive this as a threat? If so, you're going to get a stress response. You know, if you stick a gun in the face of an SAS soldier, he might shrug it off. If you do that to a schoolgirl, she's going to crap her pants because she perceives it as more of a threat. So if you feel less sore, the chances are you're going to feel better, you're going to be less stressed. So I think it does have a value in that regard. How, how does that then affect injury? When you feel... Because if you, there's one of the books I've listed, once you put the body in a state of stress, it diverts its energy production from processes like growth and regeneration to the immediate survival of the organism. Which is why you know you crack your pants because that's digestion costs a lot of energy. So get rid of it. That's why you get mobilisation of glucose from adrenaline, immediate survival. And if you're stressed and focusing on immediate survival, you're not adapting. And when you cease to adapt is when you start to get hurt because there's an imbalance between the environment and the ability of the organism to adapt. Which is why for a lot of people, if you're really really stressed, training will suffer because you, you've not created that environment to tolerate stress. Does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> I've sort of been using, using ice in terms of injuries, or cold. cold. Um, if, I think the way we're sort of doing it at WASP now is if it's, you know, like a grade one, if it's just micro trauma, mm -hmm. we're not going to use ice. But there may be a value for more severe injuries. Yeah. But that's more. It's supposed to reduce the diameter of your blood cells so it's a soft internal bleeding in your muscles. That yeah. Thing. So in terms of... Uh, that type of injury, you know, yeah. stress of the body, then you say they were useful. I've got no data to say, my hundred be yes. Yeah. But I'm happy to be proved wrong. 
Um, so yeah, like I was saying, we have the, the power output stuff. Because the, the extensive stuff you can recover from so quickly, you can recover from aerobic work within a day, you know, maybe a few hours. We only really focus on the, the central nervous system stresses like you know, power output. Uh, we measure on the watt bike for six seconds, or we measure a broad jump. Um, if they perform really well, you know, 97 to 100 percent for a personal best, they get no choice in the matter. They get stressed because they're in an optimal state to to withstand stress. Do they know that it's broke 97? Yeah, they know. They know. They so we'll, we give them a little goal. Yeah. You know, we say this is what you got. Try and beat it. And because they're competitive, they always try. Yeah. Unless you get some really lazy players. Yeah. Do you ever get lazy people who go, Oh, I got 97? Few in the first team. To be honest, the culture is a little bit different in the academy because they're still trying to make it. They've not made it. Um, you get that a little bit in the first team. But on the on the main as work. Yes, I find. Um, you know, teenage lads have always got a hard on for lifting heavy weights, and if you put them in a situation where they end up performing and you don't let them, they're going to sulk. Um, so yeah, 92 to 97. Maybe a little bit of stress. But, you know, this five percent is a big, big difference. Do you have it like written anywhere? So it's, it's I've got photos coming up. So I have a monitoring sheet which generates the, the numbers automatically for me. So um, I can maybe show you my laptop in a little bit better detail. We have this band where you know maybe they're a little bit stressed. Um, perhaps they know better than anything. Uh, a coach that I follow called James Smith in season does not prescribe intensity or volume at all. He'll just let them work up on a max effort lift and he'll say, does that feel like a good way? And they'll say yes. And then he'll consult something called Prolepin's chart, which provides uh, volume recommendations. And that's how he does it, because the athlete knows himself better than you do. With my guys, not so much, because if you tell a teenage lad you can lift whatever weight you want, they'll go, right, one rep max. So I'm, you know, I'm a little bit stricter. But we do let them self-select the volume. So we'll provide rep ranges. So we will say, you know, anywhere between six and ten reps at 90% of one rep max, dictated by how you feel. And they're pretty honest about it. So if, if, you, if you explain why you're doing something, they will uh, they'll cur cur curtail their efforts a little bit. Uh, around here, you know, no real CNS intensive efforts. We might say if we're doing speed as a group, you know, ease off, don't push it. Um, just tick a box for the strength work. Don't don't try and set a rep max. Just you know five reps of this weight. Uh, anything below ninety percent is a regeneration session, uh, which is typically you know assistance weights, body weight stuff, CV, cardiac output, um, extensive tempo, off the stuff like that. We use training diaries. Um, every session we do, everything, anything physical, we ask for the content of the session, so we can get an idea of whether it's CNS intensive or extensive, the duration of the session in minutes, <coughs> and the rate of perceived exertion. Not perfect by any means, but once you get duration and RPE, you can get um, a load. It just gives you a number, which is always useful because you can go to a technical coach and say this number, rather than trying to explain yourself, which is why I love the FMS, because it just gives you one number. You um, use the bog scale for that? Uh, one to 10. Yeah, we say one is lying in bed, ten is being chased by somebody with a knife. So, um, what's interesting is, in the academy level, you will see a far, 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 far higher load than you would in first team level. A good first team load in a, in a match week for a premiership player for us is about two and a half thousand training units. We have a kid at Tunbridge School who is England 17s rugby, England discus champion, and plays, plays a bit of cricket. He can hit 6,000 in a week. So maybe that exposes some of the weaknesses in the academy system where you have multi-sport athletes. Um, a, a big thing I've done this year is looking at that data is actually ease off my athletes. Because I think by trying to train them and have my say in how they're trained, I've just fatigued them more. I've not actually made them better. So although it's counterintuitive, with a lot of athletes this year, I've done less and less. And I hope it works. Um, injury log. Keep them playing. You have to pay attention to that. How are they getting hurt? Is it contact? Is it non-contact?